Okay, thanks everyone. Um, I guess that's the introduction. I've, I'm a, an analyst developer and I've been with the Atlas now for about four years. Um, my, uh, I, I first developed Zoatrack, which is a platform for animal tracking data, and both Zoatrack and I were taken um, on, into the folds of the Atlas um, so, uh, some time ago, and I've wheedled my way into this uh, management position, and that's the capacity that I speak to you in today. So I, I work with all of our uh, ecological analysis tools. So a quick introduction to the ALA. Who here has heard of or used the ALA? Okay, so we're kind of all friends. Um, <laughs> the ALA is, um, is a big database of all plants and uh, animal um, information. So we're an aggregate of biodiversity data. We pull it together from multiple sources and then we make it freely available for reuse. So we're funded by NCRIS. Um, the uh, important words there are collaborative infrastructure. Um, which means that we're driven by an open source software development um, strategy and open data policies. Uh, we're hosted by CSIRO, there's about 30 of us. Um, some, most of our staff are based in Canberra at Black Mountain and there's um, a handful of us littered around Melbourne. Um, we're the Australi Australian node of GBIF and you saw GBIF before in Jane's talk. Um, uh, GBIF has several international nodes. And um, we're partnered with a whole heap of museums and collections uh, people. So the original idea for the Atlas came from um, all the museums and collections wanting to have a central database such that they could look up their species and location information. That was around about 10 years ago. We're still partnered closely with all of those guys. I'm based at the Melbourne Museum myself. Uh, our open source software development has um, been really successful. We've got countries all over the world now picking up our software and, and using it. I don't know what happened there. Um, about a dozen and there's about 10 more in negotiation. Just last week Austria came on board and Sweden signed up recently as well. We're working on building that Living Atlas's community basically so now that it just doesn't become a whole heaps of, of forks of our software and we can um, end up having a, a, a common code base and get the good work that those other countries are doing, collaborating and bringing stuff back, uh, back to us. So my talk will go through these um, elements here on the left hand side, data capture, um, processing what we do to the data, um, some of our discovery tools and um, mostly our data analysis and visualisation, uh, a couple of our visualisation platforms. Just quickly with data capture, we have a data management team that sits there and pulls data in from all sorts of different places. Uh, we have automated and manual loads. We speak uh, Darwin Core. Quick show of hands for who knows what Darwin Core is. <laughs> it's more or less a biodiversity data standard. Um, so for us that means it's a bunch of 186 terms. We can tell people make these your file headers and we roughly know and understand what those things mean. So it contains things like species name, uh, species scientific name or decimal latitude, decimal longitude. Uh, we've got other platforms that pull in data or non-occurrence data, um, you might say, or some occurrence data. We've got a BioCollect platform for supporting citizen science and field data collection, uh, a profiles app that gives us more descriptive information about species. Zoatrack is my application for managing and visualising um, animal tracking data and Digivol we support as well which is a, a, a digitisation and transcription platform. No, down this way. Okay, our data processing, I just wanted to take you through uh, the sorts of things we do to that data once it comes in. We uh, run it through a massive engine, we, we augment uh, each record with a whole heap of information about taxonomy, about environment and the spatial context and then we run a whole heap of data quality tests on that data. So our first, our first stop is taxonomy. We've got a piece of software that we built called the Large Taxon Collider and <laughs> the guy's a quantum physicist. And he, he, um, we work with all of the different Australian taxonomic authorities and we try to come up with a big giant list, unique list of all Australian species. 
It handles things like updates as, and, and, and merges and uh, synonyms and all of, those, uh, all of those sorts of things that happen in taxonomic names. And for those of you who aren't aware of uh, what a bloodbath taxonomy can be, <laughs> it's quite an exercise. Um, so, so we get that taxonomic information, we come up with the right, what we think is the right scientific name for that organism and we actually add to the record the whole taxonomic tree, basically, so it's easy to look up. We host around about 500 uh, spatial layers, different environmental layers, contextual layers. Um, I had no idea how to describe all of these on a slide, so I'm sorry about how much information is there. But uh, an important part of our data processing is that we take each location and we intersect it with each and every one of those layers. We grab the value back and put it up next to the record so that we've, so that we've got that um, easy to use later on. And then we run our data quality tests. Um, we have around about 100 data quality tests. They're in the process of being internationally standardised for biodiversity um, through the Taxonomic Databases Working Group, which is the... Uh, Darwin Core, the Darwin Core people. So uh, Jane alluded to before the idea that um, there's lots of data quality issues within the Atlas and that's entirely true because we rarely actually throw data out and we don't set ourselves up to be the judges of what makes uh, a, a good record. Instead we try to run these um, so that we can help people assess the fitness for purpose of a record for their use. We run these 100 data quality tests um, that they can then pick and choose what, what might be useful for their, um, for their purpose. So species distribution modelling is all, is obviously needs a really high quality record and you would do quite a bit of filtering before you found your right data set for such a scientifically important, um, uh, scientifically important goal. But if you were just mucking around with data, you might just want everything. Um, so those data quality tests do things like um, check names, check whether uh, that record is where we would expect that species to be, among other things. And there's, I think around half of them are location-based testing. So what we've got in the end um, can be a record that's up, yeah, up to a, a thousand fields wide and we put that into a Cassandra database and index it um, index with solar so we've got a we've got a lot of information that's come along with our original record most people most people I don't know if it's most people would you, we've got a, a web front end for navigating our data we call it the biodiversity information explorer you can search um, species location you can go in through your collections or by data set um, probably our biggest strength is our web API. So the Atlas is a service-oriented architecture. So we have our, um, our database out the back that we call Biocache. Um, and we've got uh, lots and lots of different front ends, not just our main front end, but also other front ends like the Australian Virtual Herbarium. The thing is that our, our database and the web service layer that sits in the middle um, to support all of our infrastructure is also publicly available. So um, we publish our, um, our API and anyone can use any of the tools that we use internally. So um, our API is on api.alo.org.au and um, these are just the groupings here on this slide of, um, of the, the different services that we've got. We've got around about 100, I think, that are, um, that are exposed. Uh, the spatial portal at spatial.ala um, is our uh, is our visualization and analytics tool for dealing with um, with all this data. So its purpose is to manipulate, analyze, display, import, export spatial data. So it's got every tool under the sun I can think of um, to to be able to to work with species, uh, with areas the layers and those um, thousand or so facets. So you can come up with, um, so that you can come up with, you know, visualisations as such. All the river red gums in um, uh, 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 occurrence data coloured by the, the type of observation that they are, like the specimens for, from the museums as, as opposed to human observations. Um, 
we've um, we've coloured there the um, MBIS subgrouping um, that the, that those occurrences lie in and overlaid it with a temperature layer. So those are the sorts of um, you know visualisations uh, that that we can do within the spatial portal. It's um, it's got lots of, um, lots of other tools out the back end. There's scatterplot analyses um, for working with the uh, continuous variables that come in through the, uh, the environmental layers. There's cross tabs for the discrete variable, discrete variable analysis. Um, there's uh, pr prediction software in there, Maxent, and um, I think there's around about, uh, we have identified, there's around about 17 um, anal analysis tools in the spatial portal. Then we have ALA for R. ALA for R was written uh, around about, well, when, around about 2014 by a chap called Ben Raymond at the uh, Antarctic Division. Um, ALA for R hits those uh, web services and puts them in a nice spatial points data frame so that they're right there to use by, like, by tools like uh, Leaflet and ggplot, and it's really trivial to to get that going if you're a if you're an R programmer. Uh, I think it covers most of the API. Uh, it doesn't. It covers the mo the more um, well used uh, API services. So. Um, just for my last couple of words, um, I just wanted to talk to you about some of the issues that we're having at the moment um, around, around, around spatial stuff. We're coming up 10 years old. Um, next year we'll be celebrating 10 years of going live, which is pretty cool. Um, and I guess, you know, f pardon? <laughs> I think, I think um, it was originally, Phosphor G was here, was it in Melbourne before or? Um, so we got a lot of help, uh, I hear, last time we came um, with uh, dynamically producing tiles and, um, and these sort of services. So we, we um, are appreciative of, of the conference. And, um, and we're sort of turning from this innovative startup-y sort of culture into a, a BAU house. And we, we've got a lot of work to do. We haven't out looked outward a lot, I think. And, um, you know, we've, we have to look into things like these WXS services and what's going on, <laughs> Get, uh, uh, making sure that we're, um, we're keeping up with new tech. Uh, probably our bigger problem though at the moment is our 500 spatial layers. They come from all different agencies. Um, we want 200 more. <laughs> We've got 200 more waiting in the pipelines. Um, they're all different. They all have different licensing arrangements. They all have different metadata, different coverage, different styles, scales, all sorts of all sorts of things. And I'm sure there's a few of you in this room who are familiar with those sorts of problems. And I guess we're wondering who else is dealing with these sorts of problems, and uh, is there a call for a central agency that can manage? These sorts of things that we can then, that can then help us with web services like we have um, to 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 intersect those layers and send us back a you know a value. So we have we have those services ourselves. We we produce the service. You send a lat long and your layer name, or you can get values back for all the 500 layers if you like, and it'll, and and bring back those values. We have a batch version of the same, and uh, we feel it wouldn't it be great if someone else could do that. <laughs> um, so you need scalable infrastructure, standardised layers, standardised vocabularies, all that sort of boring stuff <laughs> that uh, isn't such sexy work to do but has such great returns. So uh, that's it for me. Thanks very much, everyone. And um, um, yeah, are there any questions? Yes. It's a bit off topic, but uh, has, have you guys ever thought of using your sightings um, and species database to do like machine learning? Yes. Do, like, uh, I guess, um, well, we're teaming up with iNaturalist, who are really um, in an exciting place with deep learning. So they've been working with, um, you know, Google and Amazon and all those sorts of people to do, um, to do species identification on the images. Yeah. So that's great for well-known species, but once you get to the tails, where you've only got a few uh, images, that gets harder and harder. But yes, we're, we're really looking at deep learning and machine learning and trying to work out where can we, 
Where can we get stuff? <laughs> that would be great, uh, you know, people just taking photos, wondering what species it is. And yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, well, um, check out iNaturalist. It's yeah. got a really great species suggestion functionality, and we're bringing, we're creating an Australian node of iNaturalist um, on leading that project. Cool. cool. Any questions? Anything else? Okay, thanks very much. Thank you.